Vi har det. Okej. Som... Okay. Uh, got it. So, let's start. Hi, uh, today we are hosting Jordi Pontuset from Google Research Zurich. Uh, we are working together about six months. Today, he will talk about uh, their res recent ever efforts on integrating vision and language at Google. And let me introduce uh, his short bio. Uh, Jordi Pontuset is a research scientist at Google Research Switzerland since uh, January 2018. Uh, previously, he was a postdoctoral researcher at ETH Zurich uh, against Switzerland in Professor uh, Luke Van Gogh's Computer Vision Lab CVL since 2015 and interned uh, in Disney Research Zurich with uh, Professor Aloha uh, Smolich in 2014. Uh, during his PhD, he collaborated with Professor Jitendra Malik's uh, vision group in UC Berkeley. He, he received his PhD with honors in 2014 and uh, MS degree in research on information and communication technologies in 2010 and the degree in mathematics in 2008 and the degree in electrical engineering in 2008 again, all from the Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya, uh, Barcelona Tech, in the beautiful city of Barcelona. Well, uh, uh, I'm, I'm leaving the stage to Jordi, but before we start, Jordi, are you planning to take questions in the end of the presentation or during the presentation? No, no whenever you want, like yeah, during the presentation may be better so mm -hmm. that I don't feel as alone at home and talking to a screen. So please <laughs> interrupt, interrupt me at any point and make it a conversation rather than a, than a talk. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so you can start. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Charan Salim. Thank you. Fatma also for uh, for having me, or should I said Ojan? No, that that would be the the, the right word, I think. Uh, or maybe I completely missed it, but yeah. So um, yeah, uh, thank you for for inviting me, for having me in this beautiful campus that uh, I would be if 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 it wouldn't for for COVID. And I'd like to talk to you, yeah, as, as Chagan Selim said, about um, connecting vision and language first our first work on localized narratives, and then what we've done after that. Can I get some feedback on if people are listening, hearing me and all that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, it's all good. Perfect, perfect. It is. OK, so well, I'll skip the bit about me because, yeah, all that. And I actually made me feel old, like yeah, 2008, 10, uh, 2010, 2008. Oh God, but anyway, so connecting vision and language. Um, language is kind of a very important part of human. It makes us what we are, right? And a lot of, uh, it's an abstraction of, of real world concepts that we use to communicate among us. And a lot of those uh, concepts are based on vision, right? They are grounded on, on the real world. And um, what the first we can ask is like, we are, or at least myself, I come from vision. And um, why does vision need language, right? We can say, oh, why, why, why do we need that? And you can say, well, this, according to computer vision, like you can say, hey, this is a dog, right? I mean, we have, why do we need language? Boom, we put a, a category, Coco number three, it's dog, boom, we are happy, we can classify this. But then you can say, well, hey, hey, I mean, we have, a, there are a lot of types of dogs, right? We are a, a lot of variety, a lot of species and everything. You cannot just classify as dog or not dog, right? Okay, okay. Then I can say, well, we can go to ImageNet. There are like, I don't know how many dogs there. So all those species, we can have a hundred types of dogs. Still, we're still good, right? We can do classification, vision, we don't need language. But then of course the pandemic came and then all the, all the work, all the dogs needed to go work from home. And then they were feeling alone and they sh started sharing, uh, selfies of their of them working from home and looking interesting and then okay now to classify this image and to say what's in this image well we start to have more difficulty like this dog is like with with uh, with glasses looking over looking interesting and so we really need much more than just purely classification this is just saying a dog and this is a this image tells us much more than just it's a dog or not a dog right we really need natural language we need open vocabulary 
to really express everything that's in the image, right? And that's why we need this tighter connection between the power of, of language, the power of expressivity that language has to uh, describe what's in the image and to translate it into, into language. And the other way around, why does lang language needs vision? Well, language without vision would be all this uh, amount of text, Wikipedia, whatnot, everything that Google has ever uh, analyzed, there's all the knowledge in the world, right? So you can de definitely say, okay, I know the, the history of everything. I know what's a camel, I know what's a, a horse. But then when you start to say, okay, horse has four legs and four uh, has four legs and it's brown. Oh, but what's brown, right? Okay, you can, language can understand the language that brown is this certain color, these waveforms and everything, but it will never have seen what uh, brown is in real life. That's what's called grounding. So language without vision lacks grounding and lacks grounding in the visual world, which uh, much of the language is, is based on. So we need each other. Vision needs language, language needs vision. And how that did we researchers started studying this, this, uh, this connection? First, the first attempt were with, with what's called image captioning, which basically was uh, taking one image in, in the left and assigning it to uh, a text describing its, its content, right? So the language world would say, there's a black fluffy dog that sticks its head out of a van window, and that would be the image. Of course, that links vision and language, but we can say it's a very a sparse linking in that it's just the whole image to a whole sentence, right? We want tighter connection, and that's the it's going to be the theme of this talk: how we tightly uh, connect vision and language. So the next step was saying, well, we can just uh, give tighter connection by having the black fluffy dog and draw a bounding box of the nouns that appear in the sentence. In this case, the black fluffy dog is this here, and the van is all this part here. So we are a slightly better connecting uh, vision and language, but it's still sparse in the sense that it's only a few bounding boxes, and it's only a few nouns in the sentence. So we want still tighter connection between visual language. And that's where localized narrative, ECCV20, uh, came in in which we said, let's ask annotators to uh, move the mouse to point at the objects in the scene. And then simultaneously, uh, they would use their voice to describe, to describe what they are pointing at. Uh, thanks to the synchronicity of the mouse and voice, we can know whenever they were speaking a certain word, we can know where in the image they were, so we can ground every word that they said. We just gave also uh, some more specific instructions. And this is uh, what a result like this uh, would look like. Let's see if you can hear this. I don't know. Hi, Jordi. Uh, I don't think we can hear the audio if there's an audio. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, there was an audio, but, uh, no. well. Uh, okay, but it was we basically can... reading the text, I guess, right? Yes, yes. I can, no. I can, I can pretend it, like I can uh, do something no. like... No, 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 no oh, problem. Yes. I had a small no. question. So, um, yeah, uh, we, we did something similar with eye tracking. Why did you guys choose mouse to do this? Absolutely. So, um, I actually have some slides, but let's. So first of all, first of all, it was uh, scalability of of uh, of hardware. Let's say right. So we did that with hundreds of of annotators at scale. Like we we annotated almost a million uh, a million uh, images with this, with like two minutes long, and um, that scalability with eye tracking was not something that we could. Uh, well, that it was not yeah, scalable. Yeah. Let's say in, in that's the sense true. that that was the first uh, the first question because like a, a, a mic and a mouse, everyone has it. So that that was that was the first question. The, the first thing. Second one was that as as we'll see afterwards, um, we were uh, interested in something beyond beyond the tracking in the sense that uh, we'll see that we will use this data into annotate how uh, to 
detect and to analyze how users interact with images, let's say. So when you're with your kid uh, telling a story and you're showing the, the, the oh, the, there's a, I don't know, a lion here that goes in the forest, like you, where your mouth, where your eyes is looking is like different than what, how you would uh, teach a kid to and, and point uh, the things to a kid, let's say, right? That's true. And, um, and so we wanted to analyze this other type of modality also uh, beyond, beyond uh, eye tracking. And okay. then uh, there was also a bit of, um, we didn't experiment much with, uh, with, specific, with the specific hardware, but even if we had it, um, we had the feeling that the, um, the, the special precision and, and, and the special, um, the temporal uh, continuity, let's say, we, we could get a bit better with, with the mouse, but this we didn't do any, any like hardware uh, comparison with all that. I don't know if the current hardware uh, is precise enough to really do the, do the same that, that, that we were doing this, this, this I don't know. Okay, well, all good points, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So yeah, fr from this basically what we get, if we, if we just uh, yeah, plotted everything, all the mouse trace, mouse uh, like we synchronize it with the caption, we basically have, if you match every color here, so in the front portion, the mouse was here. So we basically have a compact uh, way of representing where every word, uh, sorry, where the mouse was, where uh, the annotator was speaking each of the each of the words, right? And then, for instance, we have well, where jacket. If you take uh, all the mouse, where the mouse was, where when the jacket was spoken, we have that this is the grounding from jacket. So we have a mouse trace over over the jacket. The same with the clouds, and then and then something interesting that was beyond what had done before is that we also had so like things that are not nouns, right? So since we ground every word, we can say well, holding when the annotator was saying holding, it was moving, moving between the hand and the, uh, and the balloon, right? So we are actually grounding other things beyond the nouns uh, themselves. Of course, some other things don't make any sense to, to ground, like we can see well, what, what, what C, right? But uh, at least all this information uh, can be extracted uh, there. Then the question, how did we get to this very nice and precise result? Because for now, the annotator gave us a speech. So we have uh, the words uh, recorded. We have the mouse that moved. And these two things are synchronized. So we know every word when it was spoken, where it was a mouse. And then, but, but we, need, we need text, right? We need uh, just, we wanted really the caption as, it, as, as, as written text. So what we do, we, we took uh, an ASR, automatic transcription uh, method, and we from this we took imagine that, that the result was a log burns on the show. This is good in that it, it's timestamp. So since it's come it's come from the sound, we know every word at the time it was pronounced. But it often has errors. It's not good enough for for ground truth. Let's say right. Like in this case, a log burns on the show. It's not the, the correct transcription. How we, did we solve that? Well, we asked the annotators to after they um, annotated, they would listen to their own recording and they would transcribe what they just said. Um, and in that, in that case, it would give us what the true caption which a dog runs on the snow, right? That's correct in the sense that the words are the ones that they were spoken, but it has no time, no time stamp, right? They were just typed by the annotator. To get the best of both worlds, what we do is we do a sequence to sequence alignment in between a log burns on the show and a dog runs on the snow. And we take the correct uh, transcription and the timestamps from the uh, in, imperfect uh, transcription, and we get the final result that we want. It's a dog, ru a, a dog runs on the snow, correctly um, synchronized with text and with mouse. And this triplet of things is what we call the localized narratives. The mouse, location, the speech, and the text uh, correctly transcribed and with timestamps. That's what we, in the end, we said localized narrative. And uh, advantages, well, as, as we said, it has dense localization. So all the words has, have been localized in, uh, in, in comparison to the previous words where people would go back to the caption and uh, take the nouns and then draw a bounding box. The descriptions are rich. As we said, they are objects, but there are also relations, attributes. 
and it's natural to annotate. That's an important, a very important thing that uh, when you go to scale, you want to annotate millions um, of, of images. If the task that the annotators have to do is difficult, you have to train them, then they won't do, the, they won't do it properly, then that doesn't scale well, right? In our case, it was very natural because we just didn't need to, uh, to train the annotators. We just said, speak, uh, describe what you, image, uh, what you see in the image and move the mouse uh, around, which is very natural. It comes natural to, to, uh, to annotators. And something interesting also is that it's, it has a safe worst case scenario, right? Imagine that you're annotating uh, detection and you are, you are assigning labels. If you assign a cat, to a dog because the rater doesn't know uh, the annotator doesn't know what a cat is or what a dog is, then you're basically doomed in a way, right? You're like, oh, uh, you cannot recover from that error, right? In a way, unless you you do some some uh, quality detection. In our case, though, it's just if an annotator, since we are not forcing them to talk about anything special, if an annotator doesn't know about some some words, they will simply don't say it, right? If if they know that that dog is a Labrador Retriever, they, they would probably say, oh, a Labrador Retriever. If they don't know it's a dog, uh, sorry, it's a Labrador, they would say, oh, it's a dog. If they, if they don't even know if it's, the, if it's a dog, they might say there's an animal. And maybe even they don't even say anything, right? But in any case, it's, not, it's, it's rarely wrong. It may be incomplete in the sense that you don't get all the information that you could get from the image, but it's rarely wrong, right? And that's a, a very good point when you want to scale uh, to millions of images. And it's relatively fast, right? So it's two, two minutes, 25 seconds per image in which narration is, is the slower part, uh, sorry, is the uh, fastest part and the transcription, transcription takes longer, which then we could envision that if uh, uh, speech recognition gets faster, then we could just skip the transcription part. All of this allowed us to go at, at scale. So we annotated 600, uh, almost 700,000 images in open images, the whole COCO, the whole Flickr 30K, the whole ADA 20K, to be able to then compare uh, against previous work. And we believe there's a rich source of, of uh, annotations here that are publicly released. They were publicly released last year. Some of the uh, stats of this, uh, as we said, we ground each mouse, uh, each word to a mouse trace. And our captions are longer than, than in general uh, caption, ca caption data set. They have 36 words in min. Um, this comes, uh, we believe, from the fact that we let them just freely speak and that it's easy for them. Uh, in terms of number of images, we are um, much, much bigger than the previous methods like Stanford Visual Paragraphs that were long uh, captions. And in terms of grounding, we are the first one that we ground each word and to a mouse trace, which is basically a finer uh, representation than, than a box. And we'll see that it's finer because we'll see some work afterwards that makes, makes use of it. An interesting thing, and that links to, to, to your previous question, that uh, some things that we discovered that was not something that we trained the annotators to do, but that, it, that was uh, getting out of data is that we saw that there were different pointing styles depending on the type of object that they were annotating. For instance, for... Um, stuff kind of things like this some grass on it so uh, annotators would typically scribble over it and like the, the, do this type of, of annotation for more type of object uh, thing type of style it and and usually also smallest things a uh, circling was also very common that was something that we were not thinking uh, about at the beginning right we said oh we will get some pixels that uh, we, they will go, go over some of the pixels that they have but circling doesn't touch, in this case, doesn't touch any pixel of the, of the ship, right? But still, to us humans, it comes very natural that, oh, if you circle around, yeah, it's clearly that you are meaning the object in the center, right? That's something that we couldn't have got in uh, with, with eye tracking, right? Or like, I don't think anyone goes around looking at, at the object like this. And then also that comes very natural for text, for instance, people tend to underline it uh, rather than circle or, uh, or scribble over it. So from the human interaction point of view it's also very rich in that we see how different people ground things we can see it also as a disadvantage in the sense well if we just want to train models out of it it's not as straightforward as if the, everyone would scribble on the pixels right but we see it as a as a benefit in which we can learn 
from how humans uh, ground things naturally. So Jordi, related yes. to, the, to this, uh, when you were uh, developing the data set, what kind of mm -hmm. tasks uh, for like machine learning models, let's say, did you have in mind? And, and so, was this annotation actually suitable for those tasks? Or after you saw the annotation, you thought of other tasks and stuff. So can you talk about the targeted tasks a bit? Yes. Uh, so we it was more motivated by the um, annotation. So we at, at, our, at our group within Google, we've been working a lot in annotation, like of object of image segmentation, of, uh, of object detection, right? And we suffered, and that at Google scale, right? At, at millions of, of images. And we, one of the things we struggle the most is how to make the annotators uh, be precise and, and do the things correctly, right? It's, it, of course, you are trying, you are making them annotate in open images. For instance, we have 20,000 different categories annotated that are human verified. 20,000 concepts that are very fine grain. How do you make them, uh, how do you make a big pool of, uh, of annotators? Uh, well, learn about all those categories and uh, annotate them correctly, right? That's a struggle, that's difficult. And you end up putting a lot of effort into uh, how to make the, uh, the annotation correct, right? And that was uh, more than a question that we said, let's try to see, to go to the other end of the spectrum. We don't train the annotators at all. We just let them do what they know, what we know that they can do, which is just talk about the images. And then we will do the heavy lifting afterwards with, uh, with machine learning and everything to try to make sense of that, of that data, right? So it was more, we didn't have any task in mind. It was more, let's see, instead of putting the, all the work beforehand, like engineering, how to uh, make the task that the annotators can do it and then have good results, clean results directly afterwards, Let's just not train the annotators, let them uh, talk freely and annotate freely and see what we get out of it, right? So it was, we didn't have any task in mind, to be honest. We then, uh, as you'll see, we've ex explored uh, many already and we envision that there, there can be many others, but it was purely an exploratory uh, human interaction experiment and say, how, what can we get when we let them uh, talk freely and what can we learn from knowledge, from biases, from how they how they ground their things. And um, yeah, so that it was it was uh, I said just motivated by the exploration of, of how can what can we get from completely free uh, annotators. Yeah, I, I, I totally uh, uh, agree with not training the annotators and you know trying to get inter annotator agreement and stuff having tried to do that. And and also, I think the, the opportunity of new problems coming up, for example, after seeing this slide, we have, uh, you know, some faculty working on HCI and, uh, you know, um, you know, pointer devices and stuff. So classifying these pointing styles and, uh, you know, uh, maybe getting some information from the style of the pointer is, is a task that I would have never have imagined uh, before uh, looking at your no, data. So that exactly, uh, that's a nice, uh, you know, uh, opportunity. Yeah, no, we absolutely we didn't like. Uh, I, I will never claim that we thought of. Oh yeah, yeah, we will, we will uh, explore the, uh, the pointing styles. It was more we we just had thought. Okay, they will go over the image, uh, over the the pixels, and then, and while we were analyzing this, like okay, let's let's get some some data out of it. Like the, the pixels, we we thought, wow, there are some that are completely off. What's happening? And there we started analyzing and we saw all these things and we said, yeah, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense, right? A posteriori, yeah. it makes sense. And uh, it's, some, it's something that we started doing a bit, but we haven't done uh, properly to really detect something that I, uh, like just without, I have a feeling that even without just the traces themselves, if you see them, uh, someone moving, we as humans can detect, can clearly detect where they were pointing that's just right. by looking at how they move without listening to the without listening to the to the audio without seeing that even the, the, the picture right so we have it it's clear it's inherited in our in our brains it's it's really so it's um definitely something that i think it's 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 interesting to 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 analyze yeah 
Okay. So, I, sorry, sorry, you were, you want to say something? Oh no, okay. So let's talk a bit about accuracy, right? We said, oh yeah, we let them talk and and just move the mouse. How do we know that uh, it, so it kind of makes sense what we get out of it, right? Um, and so what we did was we took the categories uh, of Coco. So we, since we annotated Coco, we took Coco, we took the 80 categories, and we did string matching, very simple string matching that when they were mentioning the categories of Coco, so um, they mentioned car, boom. So we take the, tra the trace of car and then we have the bounding box from Coco so we can, and since we have so many data, even though we are just sampling a very small, like, like those IT categories, we still have hundreds of thousands of, of nouns that we can then uh, analyze the accuracy on, right? So then we took the mouse trace while they were mentioning the IT categories of Coco and we did a, a heat map over the, uh, like centered on the box, that's the, the truth. And that's the, the, the left one. So we see that despite they sometimes go wild and they circle and everything, in mean, it's really on, on, the, on the object and centered to the object. So that's, that's good. And then in terms of semantic accuracy, so yeah, they are on the, where, when, they, uh, when they say something that, that's in Coco, they are on, on that image but they mentioned so many things, right? So then, then what we took, we, had, we took a hundred localized narratives and we manually revised uh, all the nouns and the verbs and checked whether it was semantically accurate. As that, for instance, if you have the image on the left, if they would have said bottle, we, we would have said, yes, that's correct. If they would have said juice, we would have, have said it's correct. But if they would have said jar, we would have said, oh no, this is not correct. This is not a jar, right? And the same with the verbs. if. Uh, there was no border. If they were something, would if they would have said someone is skating, we would have counted uh, uh, incorrectly. So that's very a very kind of uh, strict metric. And despite that, we we got that we saw 98% uh, accuracy on the uh, on the se on semantics, which we believe this is not this is due to the fact that we are not forcing them to talk about things they don't know. So they just talk about things that they know. So if they so if they don't know that uh, this person is snowboarding, they won't make up that it's, oh, it's skating. They will just say, oh, someone is in the snow, right? If they don't know that's snowboarding. Um, and now let's go to the tasks, right? We say, okay, all this data, which tasks can benefit from, from localized narrative? And uh, we'll start with the ones that we've explored, and then we'll talk about some, some ones that we haven't. So we have the four modalities, we have speech, we have the mouse trace, we have the text, and we have the image. If you take, from the image and you go to text, that's what's called image captioning. Well, we could, with this data, we could um, envision another task, which is controlled image captioning. So at this time, you have the, the image and the trace. So you, you imagine that someone goes over the, the image and, and say, oh, like you can imagine like vision impaired uh, people, for instance, that they move, that they, they have a tablet, but they don't really see exactly what's in the image. So they would they, they have a doubt in a certain area and they move the, the mouse or, or their finger around that area of the image and the, you can envision that the, uh, the machine talks out loud while they move the mouse over a certain region, right? That's what could be control image captioning at test time. And that I will talk uh, about next because what, what we explored. And then you can also envision that the traces are only at test time. So you can see that in these uh, transformer architectures, uh, fancy uh, architectures right now, you could see that the attention map that they do between image and, and text, you could supervise it somehow with the image traces. And we've seen that they, someone has already done that. It's not from our lab, but someone, and I'll briefly talk about it at, at the end. So this is part of, the, of what we explored in the, in the paper. It's in, in the task control image captioning. So we have a, a captioning model, which is was a, start, a state of the art at the time. And you give it this image and the output is, there is a fire hydrant and, and this is a road. This is trained on our data. That's why there is some, this is a road, which it wouldn't make sense if, if you were pointing, right? But then if you give it as input, the image plus also the trace, so this is a trace that, that moves around the mouse, we can get then this, this caption, which is much more detailed. Like in this image, we can see a platform they, there is a yellow color pot on it, and on the left side there is a road, a car, a few trees, and in this in the right side, right? This matches what the user gave uh, at the input. So if you get the same image but another trace, so in this case 
the, the annotator started from the top uh, left corner here and started going down, you can see that it start, the caption adapts to this input. So it says, the image consists of a car parked on the road. In the top left, there is a car. To the right, there is a footpath and a, and a fire hydrant, right? Of course, it's not perfect, but you see that uh, we get much finer grain captions that they, uh, it's not a caption that describes the image alone. It's the caption that the user wanted from this image because they were going through the image and uh, at the moment that they were passing over each part of the image, it was describing that image, that part of the image. Um, then another task that could benefit is text to image generation. You, you can describe an image and then uh, the image gets generated. Of course, if you have the trace itself and you can know each of the things that the user is describing where they are in the image, well, that can be uh, much more richer, right? And that we also explored in the, in the paper. And you can imagine a user getting a, a blank canvas like this one, and they start to, to talk and move the mouse. So they can say a boat here in this part. F what we do then from this is we take this trace, we get uh, to a semantic segmentation baseline, and from that, uh, from that semantic segmentation that matches the trace that you get, we get a spade and we generate uh, an image, right? So in this case, from this input, you would get, okay, not, not an impressive result at the moment yet, but something that looks more or less like a boat, but then it continues, uh, uh, the, the annotator continues talking and says, below the, the boat, I want water. Okay, now it starts making sense. Of course, that, that boat was alone in the middle of nowhere. So now with the water, this starts to look like a boat and the water and the boat and the water is where the user wanted it to be, right? So Jordi, what, um, what is the- Then what is I the want the first, yes. Please. Sorry, what, what is the image generation architecture that you guys are using here? It's this, it's this spade. It's from, from uh, NVIDIA. In, oh, okay. In, it was in CPR 19. At, okay. at the time it was the state of, of the art very good. Uh, right now, probably it's, it's, it's outdated. Um, so yeah, yeah, we don't uh, take any claim on the image generation part. We just transform the, uh, the, uh, the traces into a semantic segmentation map. And then of course, when you have just the boat then, and you don't know what to put around, it's still not rich. But then in here we have, um, yeah, once you say, oh, the boat is in, in water, you start to see some nice result. And it's, it's fun that it's, uh, this is of course uh, because of spade, not because of us, but in here it's a, a kind of a closed boat. But then when you say you want a person here, well, then it becomes a, an open boat. And then uh, this person has an umbrella, well, it puts an umbrella here. And then, uh, oh, and there's a mountain here. And you can see that it's the, the, the model is not just copy pasting parts because when you see, when you change the mountain, the color of the water changes accordingly, but that's, that's definitely because of state, right? So basically we have a fun way of generating images by just saying, what do you want in which parts uh, of the image? Then other tasks that can benefit from, from these four modalities that we have. So if you get from the text to the image, that's just a speech, trans uh, sorry, sorry. From the text, from the speech to the text, you have speech transcription. But what if you also have uh, an image and where it is from in the image, that would be then grounded the speech transcription. That would kind of, you would say, well, in terms of practice, maybe it doesn't make too much sense because who would be speaking? And it would only be like to get more localized narrative, right? But you can think of, for instance, in, in, in picture, in uh, movies, we have the, the script, uh, sorry, we have the person talking and we have the image which is related to what they are talking about, right? So we could see that only the speech plus the image gets into the transcription and we would get maybe better transcription. And that's something that we could train uh, with this data. We haven't explored, but we could. We thought it would be interesting. Um, and so we, we Jordi, uh, yes. Sorry, yes. there's another uh, cheap uh, benefit that uh, we, we can mention there. I mean, in, the, in a situation where you're talking to a robot, and giving it instructions and stuff, mm -hmm. um, you you're, you occupy the same physical space and can you know see the same scene that you're seeing, and that could actually help uh, disambiguate uh, some of the speech signal too. So I think that, yeah. that that would be a good application of this. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's something that you could train 
uh, with our data that we have, yeah, images matched to speech that talks about the image, right? So that that that's uh, a great uh, something in robotics that could be very interesting too. Um, then, yeah, so in here then we, we listed uh, beyond those that I talked, a, a list of things that by taking some of our data, image, text, speech, and, and the grounding itself as in and out, we have all these types of, of questions that we believe can can benefit from from uh, from our data. And so, yeah, basically that's, that was presented at, at ECCV uh, last year and we made the, the data available. And well, now we are starting to see that there's some, some tractions around it. And so um, the talk, I said it was localized narrative and beyond. So, so far I've talked about localized narratives, uh, the first part of the title. And now let me talk a bit about the and beyond. So what we have done and what other people has done ha, have done uh, beyond this that are directly using uh, localized narratives. And I, I'll talk about these three papers quickly. First, uh, the two first are, are from, uh, I, I, I'm involved in this work. The first one is within Google completely. And it's uh, about image retrieval uh, using uh, speech and voice. So you remember you had, you took an image or let me talk about it when, when I introduce first. Then another one that it's a collaboration that I did with, with the Pablo Arbelaez groups in, in Colombia, uh, that is also at, at this ICCV, which is called Panoptic, Panoptic Narrative Grounding. And then finally, some something uh, a paper from MIT that's called Logtex. That basically is what I suggested at the at the beginning that they uh, use the trace as supervision for the attention map of a, of a transformer. So first, uh, this this paper that will be presented at ICCV, it's it's titled "Telling the What While Pointing to the Where." So multimodal queries for image retrieval. Um, in a nutshell, when you want to get uh, an image, you want to do retrieval. You have imagine your Google Photos uh, da database, and you have a, a ton of images, and you want to retrieve. You want you have a mental model of the image, and you know you want to retrieve that image. You could the first <clears throat> thing you could do is to caption-based image retrieval, right? So you do a natural description of the image, and you get out the most relevant image that match that that natural description. For instance, you could say. Well, I, I, I remember there was a photo of a horse, or you can say more fine grain, like a horse in a city that was occluding a bike in a car, because you have it in your, in your mind. That's, that's realistically, sometimes you remember that image, you clearly have a picture, but uh, you, you don't know how to find it, right? So um, with caption-based image retrieval, you go from a coarse, coarse grain uh, retrieval, which is roughly what you get now in, in Google Photos, right? That you get, like you can say horse or party or that like a key, keyword. You could get more fine grain by by giving caption uh, a full caption, right? But I said, imagine imagine this this uh, poor uh, guy here has this image in mind that he took, and he remembers like I remember this image. I have it in my thirty thousand Google Photos database, um, and and tries to type oh a horse in a city, including a bike and a car. Oh, but he takes so many pictures that the, this other image is the one that comes out. There's also a, a horse. It's also including a bike and a car. So the, the poor algorithm did, did, did good, right? It, it retrieved a, a proper image, but it's not good enough. It's not the, the image that uh, Bob has in mind. So then the other option could be, well, let's make an even finer grain description of the image. It would be a horse in a city, including a bike and a car. The horse is on the left side of the image in a very close shot, cut below its neck, that's basically Bob's like he gives up. It's like, yeah, that's not, that's not, uh, that's not feasible, right? What could we do? Well, what about you talk, you describe the image that you are, that you have in mind, and you roughly point where you remember that thing. So a horse, and, not, and then Bob points to this part of the image here. The horse was here in a city, the, the, all that part is a city, and it was including a bike just here and a car here, right? That you roughly remember where it was. And I can imagine like, well, maybe with this in, in car, but like I, I definitely take tons of pictures of my daughters. And I remember some of them that I have, I have it in my mind. I really have it. I remember my daughter was here. My other daughter was here. Below there was a mountain. And that, so I can, I can easily do that. I can easily do roughly where things were in the image. So from that input, 
our uh, what we propose is to then get uh, retrieval from these two inputs, which we believe they are natural uh, to humans too. And what we'll see can be trained with localized narratives. So we basically present this new query modality that we believe that uh, can get fine grained explanation of the what in the image, but it's also very easy to point where in the image, right? So we could say that word phrase, it's not fine grained and it's not easy to point where, where you are. This is uh, here. With captions, you get fine grained uh, description of what is in the image, but it's cumbersome to explain where it is in the image. We believe our work takes best of both worlds and takes easy, easy uh, it's very easy to point where things are, and it's very easy also and natural to explain uh, what in the image in a very fine grained manner. Then that, of course, it would be ex very expensive to to get annotators to do that for, and, uh, and to uh, do actual retrieval from this data. So we simulate it from localized narratives. This is a localized narrative, mouse trace, uh, image, and, um, and caption. We kind of separate it and we say the, uh, the trace itself is on a blank canvas. We don't see the image. The caption is, is below, it's given. And then can we, with these two things, get to a database of images and get the, the image where this was uh, uh, annotated on. So we simulate as, as if a user, a user would draw on an empty canvas. So again, localized narratives is used to train and evaluate these, these uh, queries. Yes? Um, no? okay. So I was just oh, yeah. going to point, Jordi, uh, yes. I was just going to point out that this is a bit um, uh, unfairly advantageous to the model because the, the trace is very precisely matched to the image. Um, yes. In a natural query, <laughs> the, the pixels wouldn't align as perfectly. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and we thought about that and we did experiments on that. We did a small scale uh, uh, that we took um, ourselves, it was not on, on the while, but we, uh, what we did was we took the image we just showed uh, the image to us and we said, okay, this is, this is the image and this is the caption. Um, and then we just would remove the image and then would, uh, but still show you the caption because otherwise we would get like, uh, you cannot remember the whole caption. Then without the image, we ask ourselves to draw what we, what to draw that caption it, itself. So in this case, yeah. I would really remove the trace, remove the image, and then uh, make myself talk a woman sitting on the grass beside the plant with a basket. And just with a vague memory that you had seen the image before, uh, draw the, the, that. And we saw that there was a slight decrease in performance, but it was still uh, much, 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 much better than not getting the trace at, at all. So despite, so in, in this, you could, you could blame it, I guess, to the fact that localized narratives themselves are not super, super precise either in the sense that sometimes they go wild. That's true. Uh, then if the trace is not uh, perfectly aligned, we saw that it was also getting uh, getting decent results. But totally yeah. agree from the from the computer. But so that's that's we did this experiment. That one one thing. But then you can you can say another thing. All the state of the art that has been on on capture on image retrieval from captioning alone, let's say, is also evaluated this way, right? That's true. You take a that's caption mm -hmm. that that was written while the annotator was seeing the image, not yeah. a caption that you write. You're trying to remember, image, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly, right? So in a way, uh, it's it's definitely un uh, not the cleanest uh, setup, but um, but it's what we can do with the data we have without spending tons of money into then getting the, the annotators. Like, because it also from a computer interaction, like from a human interaction point of view, how would you mimic this, right? Would you yeah, it's, make it's them very see the difficult image? to model? Exactly, right? Like, would you make them see the image and then, hey, now you forget, but then, <laughs> like, it's it's right. It's yeah. it's it's not it's not trivial, right? So we definitely have an imperfect, uh, um, let's say, uh, experimental setup, but it's as close as we can get with a reasonable yeah. amount of of money, and it's how anyway the previous literature that doesn't have traces also was taking uh, right but but we thought about it and and we did a small scale experiment to to verify that our method was still 
doing reasonable things. Yeah, well, one potential idea I just had while uh, you're explaining this is uh, taking the traces and uh, applying noise to them. You can shift and scale the traces so mm -hmm. it doesn't exactly mm -hmm. match the image, and maybe that way we can model, uh, yeah. you know, the, some memory corrupted traces. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. And then the alternative could be to generate a scene graph from these traces, maybe, uh, so that mm -hmm. would give mm -hmm. a more structured representation. Yes, that's something with with we thought a lot about like whether uh, yeah, scene graph was the correct like representation in between, um, but it's not trivial, right? Like to generate a scene graph from this, it's not, uh, well, it, it's not straightforward. So that definitely would need yet like an, one paper could be yeah. just from, from traces to get, like there is from captions to, my, to their paper that's just from a caption to, to a scene graph they, they go, right? And there's full literature about it, right? And of course you could tr think of, okay, let's add the, uh, the traces on it, which then would, would uh, get even better probably the, the, the scene graph. Well, we haven't uh, analyzed it, but it's definitely something that, uh, that yeah, it would, be, it would be interesting, absolutely. Okay, so then the approach we take is basically we, take a model that it, it's an image text matching model that it's a common way of, of doing image text retrieval. So it's basically, you take images on uh, pairs of image and text and, it, and you, learn, you learn an association that tells you how close these two things are. We modify it so that it also gets the text plus the trace, right? And for yeah, benefit of time, I'll skip all this. We use, yeah, of course, transformers and whatnot, all the fancy things and, uh, and we basically get that, th these are the results in, in, in Flickr, in which we get that the text alone, the best model that we get the text alone gets a recall of 83%, whereas we get a boost of seven points, we get to 90% of, of recall once you also have the trace uh, in it. And it also works in the zero shot uh, scenario in which you haven't seen images of, of Flickr at all. You just have to train on, on, on open images and then, um, Despite this, we still get a, a very good uh, boost in performance from the traces. So the traces help in all the scenarios that, that, that we try. Um, let me see. These are some, some uh, qualitative examples in which we see that, well, even in a small data set like Flickr 30K, we get very similar looking results that along with the caption, maybe we cannot disambiguate them. Um, for instance, in this case, well, the other a person with a racket and a ball and with a trace that knowing where the ball exactly is, we, we can get to switch that the one that we want is really the, at, at, the top, at, at the top of the racket. <clears throat> Jordi, do you just concretize yes. the coordinates of the trace to the text? How do you do it? Is it how is the trace represented? Yeah. Yes, so this is uh, here. We basically, <clears throat> Have an embedding of the of the location itself. We we'll, we'll just uh, and we uh, treat it as just another just another token in here. Yeah, exactly. So we just have uh, tokens of uh, the, the the text and tokens of the of the trace of this embedded uh, and embedded trace, and then we lead, we let the self attention do its magic. But uh, basically, yes, it's concatenating the, the whole thing. And they are not uh, directly, so it's not like they are not matched directly, man with man, like uh, the trace with the, with the word directly. We let the the attention map uh, lear, learn itself. In the in well, no, no, sorry, no, no, that, that's not correct. We have we have the in the embedding, we have the cosine fancy thing that that it, it tells you which one it is. So they are in the same order. Sorry, that that was that was not correct. Yeah, yeah I'm not, yeah, thank you. Did you ah, ah, okay, okay, Sorry, I didn't. Okay, so quickly, 10 minutes just to uh, the other paper, uh, an ICCV that uh, yeah, collaboration with Pablo Arbelaez group and, and uh, students. And so in here, what we talk basically is we want really tighter grounding. So we were not happy with localized narratives in that it's not enough. Let's, can we go further? And if we, you take kind of a, from less uh, tight running to more, you can say, okay, captions, 
this is just Cocoa Captions. This is the type of branding that you get. This is the type of branding that you get in Flickr 30K entities in which every noun is granted with a bounding box. And we went, uh, localized narrative took the step ahead in which every noun was granted, but it was granted with this fluffy, blurry uh, mess <laughs> that, is, that are the traces, right? So can we, do, can we do better? And what we did in this paper was well to go what we call panoptic narrative branding. So basically it's the same data as localized narratives, but we transferred it to uh, Coco uh, panoptic segmentation. So we took, in this step, we took localized narrative, we took the Coco panoptic segmentation, 80 things categories, 91 stuff categories, and then we matched uh, the traces to the regions and the noun to the categories to see that they made sense and we transferred it to to, look, to panoptic segmentation. So basically, in the, 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 the goal is to have the, the captions of localized narratives, but each word, each noun rounded with a, a panoptic region in the image. How did we do that? Well, we just basically, we took every noun, for instance, in this case, around the table in a, in a restaurant. We take the mouse traces that are around table. This would be this one in the middle. But of course, since we know that there's time shifts, it's imperfect. We take also the ones uh, nearby. So this would be the, wh while they were saying the, this, uh, they did this, table is this part here, and then in is this part here. We take these traces, and then we match each of these traces to regions in the panoptic uh, cocoa. So basically, this, the, this trace here would be matched to dining table. This, uh, trace here would be matched to door and in would be um, uh, matched to mirror. So we have these three uh, uh, proposals, if, if you wish. And then while well, we, 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 this would be the proposal that you get from just region, so for just the, the X and Y of the traces, but then we want that the semantics match also, right? So we take these three categories and we say, okay, table, the, the, the localized narrative, they said table. Does it match to any of these three uh, categories that we got from the regions of, of Panoptic. Well, yeah, there is a match in, in dining table to dining table. So of course we did a, a robust hierarchical relationship here that match tables to, to dining table. So we say, okay, this table here is this dining table in the, in the image. And that we get the, the grounding in form of, of region to this uh, noun in the, in the, in the caption. To see that we matched sem semantically varied things, well, bicycle, the category bicycle in Coco is matched to things like a bike or cycle, but also sometimes to parts of that thing, right? So if the annotator was on something, they were mentioning something that was part of, of a bicycle, then we would also match it to that region itself, right? So in this case, they were, they were saying bicycle, we matched to, to uh, sorry, pedal, we match it to bicycle and so forth and so on. Um, so we get this data and then we propose a, basically a benchmark. We get quite a good, uh, with this method, we get roughly half of the nouns grounded and half of the uh, regions in Coco they are grounded. So it's not 100% yet, but uh, we believe there's enough data for models to be trained on. And to show that's true, we proposed a baseline based on this cross-modality relevance uh, paper which we adapted to take as input an image plus a caption. Then we select its nouns and we pass it through all these self attentions and whatnot. And we get a relevance computation that tells us each noun to which in, of, of the regions in the image that we get uh, proposals from, uh, from Mascar CNN, which or each of these regions in Mascar CNN gets matched to each of the, of the nouns in the, in, in the original caption, right? And this is uh, the results we get, prediction and ground truth basically, well, of course, these are uh, nice examples, but we get very, very good results. Uh, bear in mind, this prediction just takes into account in, as input the image and the caption, nothing else, right? So, um, and, and well, of course, uh, maskers and uh, proposals. So we got the benchmark, we got a baseline, and so then we can start evaluating. We propose some metrics, some nice uh, uh, curves here that can tell you uh, very well how your method is doing. We separate it 
in between things and stuff to be able to compare to some uh, state of the art method. And we see that our, our method uh, clearly outperforms on things, but it also covers uh, stuff, right? And just very finally, very briefly, quickly, talk about this paper from MIT that basically um, it's called representation from localized textual supervision, AKA localized narratives. In the, in here it's clear that we didn't do this paper, otherwise we would have called it localized narratives. But if you, of course, if you do your own paper, you wanna be known for something else. And so that's, that's their paper in which basically they take this idea that as input, you have an image and you have the caption uh, on that image. And each of these parts of the caption, you have a mouse trace in which you can then supervise the attention map uh, that, the, that, the, that the transformer would otherwise learn on its own, but then you're supervising. And they show that there is a huge uh, benefit of using this as, as retaining data for, for vision and language, vision and language tasks. So sorry that I rushed a bit in the end, that's, that's all. And uh, thank you for having me in this beautiful campus. And uh, I guess there are like two minutes for questions if someone still has some. And otherwise feel free to ping me, contact me and, and uh, to talk about any of these things. The Panoptic Narrative Grounding is still not public. It will be public on archive very, very, very soon. So you're the very first ones that uh, hear about it publicly. Thanks, Jordi, it was a great talk. Thank you, thank you for thank you for inviting me. And uh, yeah, sorry that I rushed a bit at the end. I had to rush a bit in the end. Perfect timing. No, I guess it, it was great. It was great. There were questions <laughs> in between, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other question? No questions. Charan Salim, no yeah, questions. I, yeah, I have a question. I quit about talking. Uh, yeah. Please go. You can go, uh, <laughs> Okay, so I was wondering, you know, in the presentation, you always um, talked about the images, but can this be um, applied to the videos or some other vision related uh, material? So we've, we've thought a lot about uh, localized narrative for videos. For me, there is, there is uh, one inherent difference and difficulty in video, right? that you have time, right? And so once you are grounding uh, something that is moving around, so you imagine a video and talk about the video, um, then when you say here, when you're grounding something, are you grounding it in the temporal space or in the spatial space, right? So something is moving and you wanna, oh, a person here, but then, so for me, it's not straightforward, as straightforward as with images. You would need to do something and like, let them pause the video and then do a, lo a normal localized narrative and then move. But then you will lose kind of the temporal part of it into that. Uh, okay, you could say something like a person is clapping now and now it finishes. So the part of the temporal dimension of like how the temporal beginning and end. So how would you ground it temporally? For me, it's an unknown here question. It's as, at least it's not, it's not as straightforward as with images. It's definitely something that it, I think it would be interesting, but it's not as straightforward as with images and we haven't explored it yet. Um, but it's definitely something that sounds reasonable, right? Like, oh, what are we with video and moving around? But we haven't we haven't explored it uh, yet. No. Actually, it, it could be a nice way to get data for uh, motion tracking, which is a problem that you know Fatma and I uh, have been looking at. Um, mm -hmm. I'm imagining like a soccer game, people running around, and you can basically you know trace someone with your mouse and say, oh, this guy is gonna score next. And, um, that yeah. would be your data. I mean, there there have been data uh, at, 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 at the previous lab at, at CDL that they did uh, like Gigli. I think Gigli came and, and gave a talk. I don't know about if about this, but basically they were just saying, can we do tracking by just like following someone with a mouse? That of course was just like pedestrian, very uh, close. But uh, I can imagine, yeah, if you have to kind of to be concentrated to be tracking someone, and then you're kind of only concentrated about that. If you're then talking also about what's going to happen, and I, I can imagine that it gets messy very quickly, but definitely, definitely interesting, interesting things for sure. I, I said we haven't explored it, but, um, but yeah, could be interesting, definitely. 
one more question. So, sorry, Charles. <laughs> yeah, I have a question actually. Um, yes. Uh, the spade model that you have told uh, takes a semantic segmentation input as the input, right? And it generates yes. uh, some sort of scene. And mm -hmm. uh, actually, in technically, uh, uh, I wonder how this um, drawings, like, uh, look, as you said, localized narratives converted it to a semantic segmentation beforehand. I couldn't get this part, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you couldn't get it because I didn't explain it, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, we explore different things there. First, the, the obvious things of like just like I don't know, making a blob out of out of it, like uh, uh, dilating it and whatnot. That didn't work very well. And what we did in the end is just we took semantic segmentations from the uh, training set of Coco, and we kind of copy pasted things that looked uh, like person. Okay. Are there any uh, persons in the train data set that are more or less in this area? And then we copy pasted that region there. And then, of course, when you copy paste many of them, we just took the sum heuristic to say which was going uh, above, uh, in front, and which. Uh, it was, I mean, it's a very naive uh, approach. There has been follow up uh, within Google that was pu published in, I don't know, I can send the paper, which was taking. The whole thing kind of end to end and generating images from uh, from the traces themselves, um, which is more, more involved. But what we did there was just a, a proof of concept that that uh, about it, right? I see. Thanks. And there's a question from Burak. Yes. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot for the presentation. It was really really great. Thank you. Uh, I just want one question about the captions. Uh, the, the people who created the captions seem to be describing the scene in 3D rather than on, like, as an image, they perceive the scene in 3D and they say, you know, there's a car behind the horse or mm -hmm, it's in mm -hmm. front or something. Like, mm -hmm. does Google have any plans of doing this thing with the 3D modality uh, rather than keeping it in 2D? I don't know, with holographic displays or something. I see. I mean, that, that's definitely interesting. Um, there have been some analysis of, like, it would be more like 2.D, right, rather than, than, than 3D in the sense that, yeah, you don't get, like, really, like, depth and everything. You just get this, these different uh, layers. Um, definitely, there is some information in localized narrative uh, to get there. I'm not sure how, how much and how rich. This, this we, haven't, we haven't analyzed it. Yeah, one thing that could be done would be, like, let's analyze everything all these relational words, words in terms of 3D, like behind, in front, next to, and all that, and see how, how often they come up with and everything. We haven't, I, I haven't personally analyzed it. There were some thoughts of, of doing it more purposely, like do localized narrative style, but then asking people to say, no, really, just do the, the for 2.5D, right? But uh, it's, it's something that it's, uh, I, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, following up uh, too much. It, it, it could be an experimental question to see how ma many of these type of, of relationships are naturally in, in, the, in, the, in the data. Of course, since we have one, well, 800,000 images, even if it's just in 1% of the images, well, you still have uh, a few images, right? So uh, 8,000 images. So it could be worth exploring. I, 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 well, we haven't uh, explored uh, it ourselves. No. But it's, it's, it's definitely, yeah. but the concept that, uh, th that's clear, right? That, People see images and they 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 automatically uh, do their three D model of the of the world and they describe it as as their model, not just as the pixels that they see. That that's clear that some of it uh, is there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. If there are no questions, I guess we can end it. Yeah. We so will thank you very much. 15 minutes again with Sean Selim. Yeah. That's true. That's true. <laughs> you deserve a break, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. Don't worry. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Ayan, really. the, that was amazing. Thank you. thank you very much for having me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. See you, everyone. See you.